Hey, I'm Dr. Morales, and in this video, I'm going to talk about AFib ablations. I'm going to walk you through a consultation for AFib ablations. I'm going to talk about why somebody should consider an AFib ablation, uh, when is the right time to do an AFib ablation, talk about the procedure details as, as well, as, talk, as well as talk about expected recovery and risks of the procedures as well. And I'm going to talk to you just like as if you were a patient coming to see me in, in my office. I'm going to talk to you exactly what I, the way that I would talk to my patients. I even have a heart model because that's what I use in, in the office to help describe to patients what I do during an ablation procedure. So let's talk about ablation procedures. And in the end, make sure you stick around because I'm going to talk about how I can actually help you with your ablation procedure no matter where you live. So let's talk about AFib ablation procedures. First, let's talk about why somebody should consider an ablation procedure. Uh, an ablation procedure uh, it works better than any medication can to suppress ready fib. You know, I always tell patients that medications are always an option. You know, I don't ever want anybody to think that doing a surgery on their heart, doing an ablation procedure is their only option. Medications are, are, are usually, usually an option. Uh, but there comes a time when medications are just not doing enough and people get significant episodes of, of AFib. Uh, they end up having recurrent uh, times when they go into the emergency room or hospitalization due to AFib despite medications, sometimes even despite being on medications. In addition, sometimes people, even though they might be doing better, they're just taking a handful of medications for their AFib to try to suppress their episodes and they don't want to be on those medications forever. And so an ablation procedure definitely works better than any, any medic, medication does. Uh, I always tell patients though that and I will talk about ablation procedures, but it's never a 100% cure. So then in the long term, you'll have less AFib with an ablation procedure usually, um, but sometimes medications, lifestyle modifications, they're all very important in the long-term strategy to prevent recurrences of AFib or to have as little as AFib as possible. So when it comes to an ablation procedure, what about timing? You know, is there, when is the right time to actually do an ablation procedure. Well, there's different levels of, of success rate depending on where somebody is with their, with their AFib. In general, people who are in the earlier stages of AFib, that's called paroxysmal AFib, where people's AFib comes and it goes and they are not in AFib all the time, they have the highest spectrum of success rate for uh, an AFib ablation procedure where they can do very well, have very minimal AFib afterwards and have uh, need less medication. So certainly the, the the less time somebody has AFib, people who have been diagnosed shorter periods of time, um, there have been some studies even recently that have shown people who get an ablation procedure within one year after being diagnosed of AFib also have better success rate as well. So there certainly is, like most things in medicine, the earlier you get it treated, the better the, the success rate. And so having AFib for a long time, waiting too long, there's just inherently more damage done to your to your own heart's electrical system where an ablation procedure success rate will just not be as good. And so definitely when your AFib comes and goes and you haven't had AFib that long, it would definitely be a more ideal time to have an AFib ablation and this is where you have the better success rate. So what actually happens during an, an ablation procedure. So this is again how I explain it to my patients and hopefully this can be helpful to you in your discussions with your doctor as well. So in an ablation procedure, first of all I always tell patients with my ablation procedure people are completely asleep so I do all of mine with, with an anesthesiologist so the patient doesn't uh, feel a thing at all. I think that's probably the most common way that this is done in the United States. I have heard some uh, cases in Europe or in other countries where it's done with kind of more twilight sleeping medications and not full uh, an anesthesia, but I do mine with full anesthesia so the patient doesn't feel anything. In addition, usually the anesthesiologist will put a, a, a catheter inside of the arteries and the wrist to monitor the blood pressure uh, from moment to moment uh, throughout the procedure. But as far as actually starting the ablation procedure itself, I usually enter uh, through the femoral vein. It's a large vein in the top of your, of your leg by, by your hip bone. It's a very large vein that goes directly up to your heart. Um, like these days I only I use three needle punctures during the ablation procedure. They all go into the same side in, in the right femoral vein uh, because I use different catheters that have its own different role uh, during the procedure. There's the one catheter that does the ablation, the actual blading itself. Uh, in addition, there's a catheter that I put inside the uh, a vein that's inside of the heart called the coronary sinus which helps monitor the heartbeat throughout, throughout the procedure. And then the third catheter would be what's called an intracardiac echo. Uh, that's an ultrasound catheter that's placed actually 
inside of your heart and it can be very useful for a lot of the steps of the ablation procedure itself. So take several catheters, go up to your heart. Now, to, to, for ablation for AFib, now, the majority of the ablation is done in the left upper chamber of your heart. And I'm going to get into a moment here discuss, discuss what I'm actually ablating in the left upper chamber of the heart. But to get it from the right side to the left side, you actually have to cross over. And that's what's called a transeptal puncture. So basically, I and other electrophysiologists will actually take a needle inside the heart and cross from the right side to the left side. And it sounds dramatic to say that, but it's actually one of the more routine parts of the ablation procedure, especially in experienced operators. And that's where that ultrasound that's inside your heart can be extremely uh, beneficial. Uh, there's a very thin portion in the middle part of that upper chambers of your heart between the right atrium and the left atrium called the fossil valve. It's a very thin little paper thin piece between the two chambers and that's where we would cross from the right side to the left side and that intracardiac echo shows us exactly where the catheters are so when we advance the, the needle uh, we know that we're exactly in that thin part of the heart where we want to be because people's hearts are a little bit different. You know, some are bigger than others, some are more rotated than others, but that echo is always right. It knows exactly where that uh, catheter is so that we can exactly uh, poke the hole in the right spot. And once you've been doing it for a while, it's actually a very quick part of the procedures. I, I, I mentioned that for a moment because people get kind of hung up on that, on that part, even though it's probably one of the more routine parts of the procedure. So once we cross over from the right side to the left side, uh, that's when we will uh, advance uh, the uh, ablation catheter. So the areas of ablating for AFib are routine for most people. Uh, it's an area in the left upper chamber of the heart called the pulmonary veins. This is where I usually bring out my heart model. So if you open up a heart, you look at the atrium with the, the top portions of your heart, in the back of that chamber right here, right where my fingers are right here, there are these four veins that go from your lungs back to your heart. They're called the pulmonary veins. They have extensions of heart muscles and nerves. And this is where most people's AFib come from. This was first identified and described in the late 90s. Uh, came out of researchers in, in Europe that this was kind of the hotbed. This is where most people's AFib comes from. So the ablation procedure in terms of the technique has been around for, gosh, you know, 20, 20 years or now to do ablation around these uh, veins. You know, people always ask me, well, do you ablate all four? Do you do one versus just another one? Like, how do you know which one to ablate? Well, back when this uh, procedure was first being described, uh, people didn't ablate all, all four pulmonary veins. Uh, they would try to ablate whichever one they thought was the problem child or the worst one of them. Uh, but then people just kept having recurrences. They kept having more AFib and they would have to come back and just ablate all of them. So it's been pretty routine and standard for a long time now that the, the main area to ablate would be around these four pulmonary veins. So you're actually inside of the heart and I always tell patients that you're making strategic burn marks inside of your heart. Okay, strategic burn marks to block the, the areas that cause AFib, to cause the, the areas that cause these extra beats and ner nerve endings that tend to contribute to uh, AFib. So in inside your heart, I'm, I'm with the catheter that does burning or make, or is a simple way to describe it. Radio, radio frequency is the technical term, but burning is a simple way that I describe it to patients. And I basically make strategic burn marks ar around these veins. Now, there's actually a couple of different options to make these st the strategic scar marks around these veins these days. Still, radio frequency of burning is probably the most common way or method that's used. That's what I use a great majority of the time. But there's all different energies that, that are being evaluated. There's lasers. Uh, there's freezing balloons. There's a, another new er energy that's under clinical trials right now called electroporation. Uh, so there's all different energies being looked at and evaluated, but still burning is the most common method that's used, and that's what I use for the majority of the patients. So I do strategic burn marks around the veins over here on this side here, and then the veins are on this side here. Whole procedure itself usually takes about two, less than two hours to do from, from start to finish. Um, you lay in bed for a few hours afterwards. Um, if everything looks good, these days I'm sending most patients home the same day of, of the procedure. Uh, if for any reason there's some shortness of breath or the patient's numbers don't look right, I might keep them uh, overnight. But I would say about these days, about 80% of my patients are going home the same day uh, of the procedure. Ironically, a few years ago, I pretty much kept everybody uh, overnight. Uh, but ironically, with the uh, pandemic, you know, really changed the way that we manage patients and trying to not keep people overnight anymore and it's just and it started uh, kind of forced to change and it's actually worked very well um, that 
I, nowadays, I, I rarely ever keep anybody overnight, and most people uh, do well. Uh, I did mention briefly about advancements in the technology for uh, AFib. The catheters are, are constantly changing. You know, when it comes to medicines for AFib, there hasn't been a whole lot of change. But when it comes to the equipment used for ablation procedures, it changes every year, like iPhones. I mean, there's constantly a new equipment, new technology, or just better ways to use the existing equipment. Uh, these changes have definitely improved the procedure. It's improved the success rate of the procedure and actually reduced the procedure time. Um, back 20 years ago, before I really start, I started doing ablation, I've been doing them for about 10 years now, uh, it would not be uncommon to see ablation procedures that were six to eight hours long. I've had countless people tell me how long their proced ablation procedures took. These days, pretty common to have one less less than two hours long. And that's a lot of big time because of the advancements in the equipment that allow you to do a good job and, and an efficient job. In addition, because it, the procedures are getting shorter and the technology is getting better, the recovery time is, is better for, mo for most patients as well. Like I mentioned, for most patients, the numbers are good. They're going home the same day of, of the procedure itself. But what can you expect at home, okay? So let's first talk about the routine things and then we can talk about the dangerous uh, risk and precautions for the dangerous risk as well. Routine stuff, uh, bruising and some soreness in the area of your groins where I enter is pretty common and, and, and expected. It should never be any severe pain, but, you know, but some bruising and soreness is expected, okay? In the area of your heart, um, so there's inflammation in your heart from the areas that have been burned. Uh, so people sometimes get chest pain for, for a few days. And actually with the advancements of technology, the chest pain that people have from the ablation procedure is actually less than it used to be uh, several years ago. But they still get it sometimes. And so and usually it's a very type of a inflammation type of pain. Uh, it's very associated with positions. It's very similar to another medical condition called pericarditis in a sense where that p chest pain is basically very positional in nature. You notice it more when you're taking a deep breath or you move in a certain position. It's worse when you're laying down versus sitting up. And that's very common for an inflammation type of pain which can happen after an ablation procedure. Uh, also, sometimes people can feel shortness of breath after an ablation procedure. Sometimes people, that's usually due to fluid retention uh, during a, an, an ablation procedure. Especially the burning catheter, uh, you know, you don't want it to actually get too hot or hotter than you want it to be. Uh, it has to be a very kind of controlled type of burn. And because of that, the catheter is actually uh, spewing fluid while it's burning. Uh, I, I usually give the comparison of a car's radiator. You know, the radiator car is designed to make sure the engine doesn't overheat. The, the, the catheter's radi radiator system is meant to prevent the catheter from overheating and burning more than what you want it to. But it spews fluid throughout the procedure. And so as a result, after the procedure's over, it's not uncommon that people have you know, a liter or so of fluid pumped into their body, so they may have fluid retention and cause some shortness of breath. Sometimes I have to give patients some uh, fluid medication or diuretic for a few days after an ablation procedure. Because of that inflammation after an ablation procedure, in the first day or two, sometimes people get low-grade grade fevers as well. Uh, that usually just goes back to the that type of inflammation in the body. And that's sort of the common kind of more expected recovery uh, from the procedure. Uh, I usually tell people they have to take it easy for you know, a couple of days, two, three days, you know, no prolonged standing or walking. Uh, after that, most normal activities are fine, uh, is what I tell my patients. However, I tell people to give Give it about a week before you do really strenuous activities such as like exercise, you know, or really heavy lifting. Uh, give that a, a good week. Uh, but most normal things after, after a few days are usually fine. Let's talk about major risks of an, an ablation procedure. Um, major risks of ablation procedure, I always tell people that there's four main things that I worry about, but also emphasize the precautions that I take to minimize those risks, okay? Number one is bleeding the heavier groins where I go in. I minimize that for a couple of things. One, I use an ultrasound. Uh, most people are using ultrasounds these days. It shows you exactly where the veins are uh, and it minimizes any bleeding risk from the area of your veins. In addition, there's also a uh, plugs now that go, that, go, that go on top of the veins to prevent any bleeding after the procedure itself. And that's really been very useful to get people up and moving pretty quickly after an ablation procedure. Let's talk about the area of the heart. Any one of those catheters can get, can get a blood clot and gives a small, less than 1% risk for stroke during the procedure. So how do I minimize that risk of blood clots uh, during the procedure. So when somebody's getting a ablation procedure, it's actually crucial to give 
blood thinners during the procedure. And so I'm actually giving IV blood thinners or heparin during the procedure to minimize any risk of blood clots during the procedure. And the good thing about using IV blood thinners is that you can monitor out the, throughout the procedure, make sure your, the blood is not too thick or too thin during the procedure. We're constantly checking the uh, blood thinning levels you know, every 10 to 15 minutes to make sure the blood is not too thick or too thin throughout the procedure. And fortunately, once the procedure is over, you actually can reverse that IV blood thinner and it wears off in just a couple, a couple of minutes. Third thing I worry about is bleeding around the heart. Any one of those catheters can cause a poke or a tear and cause bleeding around the heart. Unfortunately, that risk has actually been getting significantly lower these days, and most of that is because of the safety of the equipment has gotten just so good over, even over the last several years. One of the most important features of what the equipment that I use for an ablation procedure is that the ablation catheter, the one that does the actual burning, it actually has a, a direct kind of pressure sensor that tells me how strong I'm touching somebody's heart. Uh, you can imagine if you're burning somebody's heart and you're touching it like this, you, you may not have that, mis that, that bit of risk of poking or, or bleeding around the heart. But if you're pushing it like that and you're really causing a lot of tension on the heart, you can imagine how easy it would be to poke through, especially when the ablation cat catheter is on and burning. Okay, and So that direct feedback of knowing how strong I'm touching a person's heart has definitely helped to reduce the risk of, of bleeding around the heart. The last thing I worry about is damage to the esophagus. That goes from your mouth to your stomach. I worry about that because it's right here. It's right next to the area that gets ablated during AFib. And it can be very rarely damaged uh, just as a collateral damage is because it's in the same area. So if I'm burning somebody's heart, that heat might get transmitted over to the esophagus and then damage the esophagus as well. Uh, da uh, damaging the esophagus is called an atrial esophageal fistula. It's very rare. I mean, it's, I believe the statistics are about one in a thousand, but it is actually very serious and it, uh, people can uh, die from it. And it's a very, very serious and probably the more most serious complication from uh, having an atrial ablation. And the bad thing is that that damage doesn't happen right away. Uh, that irritation and damage to the esophagus takes a few weeks to build up. So people might actually get severely ill a few weeks after the ablation procedure. It's so serious, even though it's rare, it's so serious that there's all these precautions that I take and there's many different options for to try to minimize that heat transfer or burning on the esophagus. Uh, I'm constantly monitoring the temperature in the esophagus. If it starts to heat up when I'm in that area, I stop, I go someplace else, and then I come back and finish the job after it's cooled down again. Uh, universal precaution, I give people some acid suppressing medication for about a month after the procedure. But there's a lot of different techniques as well. There's a different catheters that can help actually move the esophagus a little bit if you're in the if it's in the way of where you're trying to burn. And there's also cooling uh, catheters that can help kind of cool inside the esophagus while you're burning inside the heart. So there's a lot of different products out there to help minimize the risk of damage to the esophagus because yes, it's very rare, but it's also very serious if, if it does happen. But those, those are the main risks that I tell to everybody as well as the precautions that I take to minimize AFib as well. So how can you minimize your risk for having uh, an AFib ablation procedure? One of it would be being tuned up. You know, I don't like to do an ablation procedure on somebody who is having decompensated AFib, very short of breath at that time. As I usually tell people you need to get better with medications first, uh, not be so short of breath because that's how you make a smoother recovery. Uh, in addition, if somebody's in AFib all the time and persistent AFib, they're feeling very short of breath, feeling very terrible for it, I will usually do a cardioversion first. That's that electrical shock to get somebody out of AFib, uh, just to get them feeling better, make them a little bit more stable. And then long term, I, I tell them that an ablation procedure will help prevent the AFib from coming back. But once they're kind of tuned up, whether that's medications, whether that's a cardioversion if needed, usually the procedure itself becomes a much smoother for the, for the patient as well as smoother re recovery time for, for the procedure for the, for the patient as well. So people may look at ablation procedures and say, well, how does it work? How do I improve my success rate? Will it work for me? Well, what are the most important features? Um, of course, knowing the timing uh, of the ablation procedure, the earlier somebody has AFib, when you're in that paroxysmal AFib where it comes and goes, definitely in the higher spectrum for success rate. Uh, you want to be tuned up as best as possible before the procedure to, to minimize the uh, procedure time as well as your recovery from the procedure. But there are plenty of lifestyle things that can improve the success rate of an ablation procedure, and there's been research that have shown that it can be beneficial. So weight loss improves the success rate of an ablation procedure. Reducing or eliminating alcohol improves the success rate of an ablation procedure. Uh, also, treating sleep, sleep apnea can help reduce the uh, 
improve, I'm sorry, improve the success rate of an ablation procedure. So there are many things that you can do that can help improve the success rate of, of an AFib ablation procedure, uh, which is kind of why I've created the Take Control of AFib program. The Take Control of AFib program is my step-by-step -step plan to help you with all the natural things that can help improve uh, your ablation procedure and actually improve symptoms of AFib. All the things from reducing inflammation, weight loss, I mean, reducing artificial ingredients, removing added sugar. I put that all in one program so that you can help improve your symptoms of AFib as best as possible. In addition, this type of stuff only improves the success rate of an ablation procedure. So if you end up needing an ablation procedure and you're also doing the lifestyle modifications as well, your success rate of your ablation procedure can be that much better and last that much longer. So if I don't need this video, there'll be a, a, a link to the Take Control of AFib program. Check out my website, see what's included in the program, and make sure you look at those testimonies of people who have actually taken the program and see what they have to say. And otherwise, I hope this video was very helpful for you if you're considering getting an AFib ablation. I hope you can understand the procedure a little bit better and when it might be the right time for you to get an ablation procedure. Um, and I wish you nothing but the best for your AFib symptoms.